eighth annual lecture, Professor Grant McCaskill of Aberdeen University. Professor McCaskill will be lecturing under the title, Disabling Norms and Acentering Churches, Autism, Long COVID, and the Return of the Old Normal. Grant received his PhD from St. Andrews, and I found out recently he's originally from the Isle of Lewis. So he goes from one end of Scotland to the other. Now a professor at the University of Aberdeen, he sits in the Kirby Lang Chair of New Testament Exegesis, a chair he's held since 2015. Prior to that, he was a senior lecturer and a lecturer. He did his doctoral and his postdoctoral projects at St. Andrews. He's written a number of books, the latest of which I believe is Autism and the Church, Bible, Theology, and Community, and also Living in Union with Christ. We're very, very blessed to have Grant with us. Um, I'm very much looking forward uh, to what he has to say, and I'm going to hand over control, if you will, of the Zoom room to Richard uh, Tiflady, our Director of Mixed Mode Training, for one moment to do some housekeeping, and then we'll be on to, to Grant. Richard? Thank you, Mike. You will notice that your video has been disabled and also your audio has been disabled. There is going to be a Q&A session after the lecture. And what we would like you to do during the lecture, if thoughts strike you or questions strike you, to please put them in the chat. And I'll be monitoring the chats during the lecture and afterwards. And we'll pick from the questions that are asked there or the comments questions to read with Grant. So, um, please don't hold back. Um, obviously, what I'm looking for is patterns and themes. So several questions ask something similar. I'll try and summarise them all um, to two into one question to then put to Grant. Uh, so take notes, type questions in the chat as you go. And even afterwards, when the Q&A begins, please feel free to put your questions into the chat. And even if you can't see them, we will have received them and we will be selecting questions from that. So on that note, I'd like to hand over to, to Grant and uh, look forward to his lecture. Uh, thanks very much. So I'm not going to use any slides or PowerPoint today. As I know it'd be true of some others, I find it quite difficult to, um, uh, to use slides when I'm speaking online. And I find it, sense, it affects my sense of engagement with the audience. So I'm just going to speak um, for attendees of a particular vintage and from the UK. I'm going to deliver the, the lecture really in Jack and Ori mode. Um, the closest I'll come to visuals is that occasionally I'm going to put things into scare quotes. I'll, I'll do this to show that I'm quoting something that I'm not personally comfortable with as a viewpoint. But otherwise, I'm just going to speak. Uh, I have some notes over here. So if you see me looking over this way, that's really what I'm looking at. Um, so, so let me open this lecture by explaining my title and the rationale for articulating it as I did. This is going to take me a little while, maybe the first 10 minutes or so, but it's going to take us immediately into the substance of what I want to consider. The first phrase, disabling norms, draws on a well-established theme in disability studies and advocacy, one that recognises the problems of disability to be generated or compounded by values and practices that presume the normalcy of a particular kind of able body or mind. The evaluation of people, their worth and their potential is often subconsciously measured by this standard with a tacit ableism built into the process and the organization of space and society is likewise determined. Those whose bodies and minds don't conform to this normalcy are typically considered lesser, deficient in some sense, and are often marginalized or excluded. Society, including the society of the church, is really built around the normal. Normal. Uh, the disabled may be included, technically, with barriers to entry addressed, but once we've entered, we often find the positive evaluation of disability to be fairly tokenistic. The disabled may be celebrated, but often as people who have bravely overcome their limitations and deficiencies. Our differences are not themselves considered to be goods. There's nothing wondrous about our wounds, 
to play on Brian, Block, uh, Brian uh, Brock's theological description of disability. Accommodations genuinely intended to help us flourish in our distinctive ways are often typically lacking. If, we push for in, if the push for inclusion is led by those who are not themselves actually disabled or actively neurodivergent, what we encounter is often well-intentioned, but is ill-formed. Now, this reflects what we sometimes call the social model of disability, which recognizes that the actual disabling of the person is a function of the social context in which they exist. If that social context truly accommodates them such that they are allowed not just to enter, but to belong within it, then the disability ceases to be a problem, often ceases to be a thing at all. I'll say a bit more about the social model as the lecture progresses, because while the model is valuable, it does have certain limits and it needs to be supplemented, I think, supplemented, not replaced, especially when brought to bear on religious contexts. Here though, what I want to note is that if disabling norms are the problem, then the task is in turn one of disabling those norms, or perhaps better of disenabling them within the community of the church. Now, a good deal has already been written in disability theology uh, on how careful reflection on God, sin and salvation, and the centrality of a crucified saviour to how we understand all of these, should lead us to interrogate and challenge the persistent presence of ableism in our values, what's been called the tyranny of normalcy. Once we bring the so-called hidden disabilities of neurodiversity into the discussion, including autism and ADHD, that tyrannical normalcy can be seen to bear not only on physical difference, but also on differences in personality. Churches are typically constructed around a certain kind of extrovert, around people who derive energy from social interaction and identify this social interaction and this kind of social interaction too quickly with the unity of the church. Those who don't conform to that type are devalued and marginalized. I mean, I've illustrated this elsewhere by noting that when churches and pastors think and pray about the kind of people they feel God needs to send, send their way if they're to grow, they seldom think we really need some introverts, nor do they often think we really need to have more disabled people in the community. Constructively, this has led to the emergence of self-consciously marginal theological identities, theologies on, in, or from the edge. Some will be familiar with Naomi Lawson Jacobs as a key figure in this discourse. These theologies, practical and systematic, acknowledge the dynamics of marginalization as the realities in which God works redemptively to bring creatures to flourishing. This is important and valuable. In this lecture, I want to supplement though this affirmation of the margins with some elements from scripture that challenge further the exclusive and exclusionary centering of particular institutions and practices. To be treated as marginal, to be marginal, something else must be considered central something from which we are functionally removed and distanced. Centres can be physical spaces or communal events, but those spaces will usually be associated with the kinds of people, personalities and bodies that we expect to see in them, in which visibility is a corollary of esteemed uh, contribution. So here again, there's a dual sense to the word a centering in the title. In one sense, I use it because I want to capture something about how churches force an inappropriate centering on things that are good, but they should not be treated in centralizing ways. Effectively, they cause the church to be wrongly centered, not on God, but on institutions or on some kind of human structure, often by presuming a discourse heavy with center language. I'll illustrate this as we go. But in another sense, I use this term uh, in order to recognize some of the radical ways in which scripture across the testaments in which is preserved doesn't simply celebrate the margins, but also conceive salvation and the community that emerges from and within it to be a-centered, 
to, to not have a centre other than the God who is not located in any one place. Vitally, this follows precisely from the recognition that God is not confined to a particular location, even if that God is identified by the particular humanity of Jesus. Okay, now why might this matter? It matters because it provides resources to challenge the wrong kind of centering, but also because it helps to expose the ways in which, even as we rail against that wrong kind of centering, we may tacitly center our own discourse in problematic ways, generating or perpetuating other marginalizations. The concept of intersectionality has highlighted the complex nature of power relations. What concerns me particularly here in this lecture is the danger of normalizing a discourse that may be unwittingly shaped by the values of the global north and the modern, often urban west. By allowing the concept of an a-centre church intentionally to constrain our discourse, we can at least sensitise ourselves to this. Uh, we may ourselves need to be careful, in other words, not to marginalise. This then is an overview of the programmatic concerns that I want to think about in this lecture. Why and how we should disenable the disabling norms and why and how we should think about church as an a-centered community of divine presence. And I want to do it particularly as a New Testament scholar, but also as a New Testament scholar who uh, is autistic and who has um, close experience with uh, people with long COVID. So let me now move into those details that particularize this around autism and long COVID. And I want to stress, um, I'm not suggesting that these two conditions are related um, in themselves, that autism and long COVID are, are in any sense related, but rather that they involve some interesting parallels of experience. So first then, the pandemic and the new normal. Early in the COVID-19 pandemic, people began to use the language of the new normal as measures intended to suppress the transmission of the virus changed the way that people worked, shopped and interacted socially. Much of our activity moved online, with meetings now conducted in virtual spaces through screens. As we moved into full lockdown, churches also adapted, in some cases with pretty loud protest, uh, delivering services online and attempting to find ways of supporting community online for those accustomed to its being maintained through in-person contact. This new normal was clearly difficult for many people to live with. They felt deprived of social interaction. Many Christians considered it to be a poor and hopefully a temporary substitute for the meaningful embodied communion of a physical localised service. For many disabled people, though, the shift had a more complex significance. What others were describing as the new normal had for a long time been the mode of interacting with the world that they had relied on and benefited from. It had been their normal. Those for whom the social and physical spaces of the church had been exclusionary, a grouping that doesn't just include those with lifelong disabilities, but also those with age-related disabilities. They had themselves developed online spaces and communities through which they supported each other and enjoyed fellowship, and indeed in which they engaged in communal worship. The collective shift to online community presented new opportunities for inclusion, although even this was compromised by some rather ableist values. Instead of churches coming to those who had long experience of managing online communities for disabled people, uh, with some pretty refined wheel systems, if you like. Churches and their leaders generally presumed that they had to start from their own zero point, reinvent the wheel, and invent a whole new way of being. But nevertheless, many who had previously found church to be rather an exclusionary space now found new access into it, new opportunities to work with others, and new communities with which to worship as the new normal aligned with their long-standing normal. The move to online community also transformed the experience of church for many autistic people. And here I draw upon my own experience as an autistic person, and as with many as a late diagnosed autistic person. Autism involves differences in sensory and social processing that can make the experience of a regular 
church service difficult. Autistic people might press through those difficulties, either because of a sense of duty or because the trade-off benefits outweigh the problems, but they will still have an effect on them, often quite a long effect on them. Physical services of worship and the attendant social events are noisy and sensory spaces in ways that neurotypical people will often not be aware of. They're noisy, tactile, smelly spaces. They're usually artificially lit. Deodorants, perfumes, the hair products that people wear, the, the hand soap in the bathroom, the badly configured PA system, the LED lighting, the polish used to clean uh, surfaces. These may all fade into the sensory background quickly for the neurotypical person whose sensory filters work in a particular way. But they may continue to assault the brain and neurophysiology of the autistic person throughout that service and may leave a lasting effect for, for a long time. It could take hours to recover from sensory overstimulation. The social interactions as well that others find energizing or comforting can be exhausting for many autistic people because they involve a degree of effort of um, understanding neurotypical communication. Now this needs some comment because even the churches or individual Christians that are beginning to show awareness of autism will often understand these sensory and social difficulties in distinctly ableist ways. The medical model of autism, what we often call the medical model of autism, has represented autistic social and sensory difference often as a matter of deficit or as a matter of dysfunction, an underdeveloped capacity to understand the community, the communication of others, particularly the non-spoken communication. So micro gestures, facial movements, sometimes linked to the theory of mind concept, but also spoken communication that involves non-literal elements. Uh, autistic people are represented as deficient, lacking a theory of mind, lacking empathy, lacking a capacity for creativity in languages. There have been some theological approaches to autism that have essentially presumed the validity of this account and have used autism as representative of deficient personhood, uh, a lacking or deficient capacity to interact properly with others and with God. Uh, so I, I'm aware of some theologians who have spoken about spiritual autism, um, which it's not very nice if you're autistic to have people use you as an, an emblem of spiritual deficiency. Even some well-intentioned autism positive approaches in church can utilize this approach, seeing autistic people as overcoming their challenges. But recent scientific research has challenged the validity of the deficit approach, recognizing an intrinsic bias in the design of the earlier underlying research, namely that the benchmarks for function all presume the normalcy of neurotypical communication. Once that presumption is recognized, something interesting emerges. Autistic or neurodivergent people are typically very good at understanding each other and can read each other's non-spoken communication effectively, while neurotypical people find it difficult to understand them. In other words, there's an equivalent difficulty involved in neurotypicals, which is a term that we use for most people, in statistical terms. For neurotypicals, reading the communication of autistic people as there is in autistic people reading neurotypicals. It's not a deficit, it's a difference. And the only reason that negative language was used in the first place of autistic people is because of the statistical predominance of the neurotypical, which gives their particular form of communication, of natural communication, the status of normality. It gives it a normalcy, in other words. This more recent research, which is associated particularly with the work of Damian Milton, speaks instead about double empathy, a neurotypical empathy and a neurodivergent one. Now, personally, I think we would be better avoiding using the word empathy of these communicational phenomena, because I think linguistically, empathy labels something more than this. It, it labels a capacity to understand or to respond appropriately to the experience of others. Um, Milton uses it in this way because it was already reduced simply to a term for modes of communication and modes of neurological mirroring 
by people like Simon Baron Cohen and others for whom autistic people are labeled as empathy deficient. Uh, interestingly, Baron Cohen felt the need to explore how autistic people might be differentiated from another category of people whom he categorized as empathy deficient, namely psychopaths. Um, this reflect the fact that autistic people and psychopaths can be bundled together with the question of how do we differentiate them, reflects something of the essentially dehumanizing effect of the descriptive language that's defined by deficit. So Damian Milton and others have shown that there is, that there is no difference, there's no deficit, but simply difference. I would take this further by saying that I'm not sure that we should really be using the word empathy of it at all. But I'm doing that not as a psychologist, but as a theologian and as a biblical scholar with a particular interest in the philosophy of language. To return to our core theme, though, the shift to online meetings was considered, and I, I use this word very carefully, it was considered to be a blessing by many autistic people even if that blessing was contextualized by the general awfulness of the pandemic. Church could now be accessed from the sensory safe space of one's own home, and the medium of the screen required new effort from everyone in social communications. For autistic people, the challenges of masking or camouflaging were now significantly changed or reduced. A camera can be turned off, allowing us to move or to adopt a posture more comfortable for us. We often like to fidget or to stim or to do something physical that will help us to relax. A few of us reported that being able to see on screen what our own faces is for our own faces are doing um, is actually helpful to managing anxieties around how we're coming across. But here's the punchline. For many of us, the shift to a collectively online church allowed us to feel, often for the first time, like we belonged and correspondingly to feel less like aliens in the church. The church on the web exhibited more web-like or rhizomatic qualities. It was distributed. And vitally like the web, this reflected an internet of people, the distributed presence of the body of Christ with the communication communing possibilities of the web providing a technological means of actualizing an already real communion between the members of the body of Christ. Uh, and crucially, for those whose uh, sensory and social profile was different, uh, elements of alienation were removed from that. And at the time, there was something of a hope that this change might have lasting effects as people talked about the new normal introducing a permanent shift. Now, let me note something about my life as an academic that parallels this in illuminating ways and that take us closer to some of the issues of justice. As lockdown arrangements came into force, academic conferences largely moved online. In parallel with wider society, there were many comments made by academics about what was lost in the shift, uh, the compromises to intellectual fellowship and networking. On screen, however, something was strikingly visible. At least it was in those events where it was possible to see the other participants. The balance of attendance had shifted to be much, much more representative of the global academic population. Now, traditionally underrepresented groups were much more visibly present. The most, this most obviously presented in gender representation, but also in attendees from economically challenged contexts and ethnic minorities. Social media posts widely highlighted that the new accessibility of conferences had also made it easier for disabled people to attend, no longer excluded by the challenges of travel and environment, and in some cases, the need for care. The significance of this shift is not just about attendance. Um, involvement in these conferences can be a key element in career development and professional status. Effectively, the old normal had maintained a certain vicious cycle that allowed those whose personal, physical and financial position was already optimal to progress and to develop in their career while constituting barriers to those whose position functionally excluded them. The playing field during the pandemic had been significantly, though not entirely, levelled. And the benefits were extensive. So in addition to conferences, we were able to address uh, intentionally 
issues of representation in our weekly seminars, intentionally maintaining gender balance and other representational issues in ways that might not have been possible if physical travel were still required. Uh, I might note, of course, though, that the problem still remained for those whose infrastructure doesn't include good broadband provision, which is an issue not just in economically disadvantaged countries, but also in many marginalised contexts in the UK, which interestingly are often labelled and dismissed as remote by those who inhabit the urban centres. Now, as lockdown restrictions were loosened, it quickly became clear that the organisations of church and academy wanted to get back to the old normal as quickly as possible. Some element of hybridity was often maintained and typically with attendant complaint, but the preference for in-person meeting was widely asserted. Importantly too, it was valorised. In the case of churches, this valorization often involved the insistence that faithful Christians should want to be in the shared physical space of the worship service. Anything else is a poor second. So not only were the exclusionary barriers re-established, but those who found it difficult to pass them were, and are, burdened with the purported responsibility of their perceived moral or spiritual inferiority. The ableist class system of the church doesn't go away, and it involves a perception that those of the inferior class are responsible for their own inferiority. The issues of justice that the pandemic brought to light, meanwhile, were allowed to slip into the background again. Disabled and disadvantaged scholars protested on social media as conferences reverted to the old normal, back to how they should be, as some people said. But to little effect, token elements of hybridity have been retained by some of the scholarly societies and associations, but there's a sense in which these constitute another class system, uh, still with a sense of tiers existing between levels of scholarship. So, secondly then, uh, long COVID and those left behind. As society and the organisations within it, including churches, have returned to their old normal in these latter stages of the pandemic, it's not just those with lifelong experience of disability and difference who find themselves excluded and marginalised again. The pandemic has been described as one of the, the most significant mass disabling events in history. While some contracted COVID-19 and recovered with no lasting effects, others have been left with serious physical, psychological, physiological and neurological sequelae, collectively referred to as long COVID. For those who haven't experienced long COVID, either themselves or in the lives of those close to them, the term tends to be heard as suggesting something like the period after we've had a cold. In fact, some people have recently, uh, in a sense, devalued the language of long COVID by talking about long colds, not necessarily in the underlying research, but in the newspaper reportage of it. In reality, the condition is devastating, leaving people who were often very fit and highly active unable to engage in even the most basic of activities. A disproportionate number of those with long COVID are medical professionals, some now former medical professionals having been forced into early retirement at a very young age by the condition, and others in positions of employment limbo, uh, neither employed nor with their employment severed. One of the problems with the category is that the actual causative factors involved in the various kinds of long COVID are still not properly understood and the physical, physical evidence for tissue or system dysfunction is not straightforward to identify. The physical nature of the symptoms is clear. Sufferers may find that their blood oxygen saturation plummets, uh, even simply as a result of using their brains to complete a puzzle. Uh, and many are affected by postural tachycardia, syncope, as well as the profound fatigue um, that will prevent day-to-day -day, uh, activities. But investigations to identify and diagnose the underlying dysfunction often don't find evidence of a problem, making it difficult to pronounce a diagnosis that would open appropriate pathways to support. Along with the kind of limbo that results in terms of management and support, this also means that sufferers experience a constant kind of gaslighting. 
by the establishments involved, by family, and even by their own minds, and really by the condition itself. Is this just in my head? Am I just being rubbish? Should I make more of an effort? Um, and there's a complicated attendant problem around pacing and graded increase in exercise. With many illnesses, recovery involves a graded return to exercise, gradually increasing amounts or intensity to recondition one's physiology. With long COVID, many specialists consider this to be counterproductive and harmful, leading to catastrophic depletion of already starved resources. Patients can be stuck then in a difficult cycle of deconditioning that can be worsened by bad advice. Significantly too, the cognitive effects of the condition can affect the person's capacity for social interaction and their processing of communication. They can struggle to process interactions themselves and can find themselves with persistent anxieties about whether they have misunderstood communication or have been misunderstood in their own attempts to communicate. And communicational uh, experiences can contribute to significant exhaustion and fatigue where people are wiped out for, for hours or even days after interactions with other people. Those of us who are autistic can empathize with these particular anxieties and these particular effects more than most. And many who belong in the category of late diagnosed or even those who are self-diagnosed but not formally diagnosed will resonate with the experience of gaslighting that those with long COVID undergo. The various phenomena of long COVID have actually been paralleled with other chronic conditions that have also been subject to gaslighting, including ME-CFS and long limes. <clears throat> in fact, some centres of research into long COVID, including the Putrino organisation in New York, are intentionally coordinating the research on the conditions in the hope that there may be mutually beneficial insights. I highlight the problem of long COVID here, noting also these parallel conditions, because those who suffer it, uh, many of whom are unable to leave their homes or even their beds, have found themselves doing so as the churches return to the old normal. They find themselves newly in a no man's land category of disability and at the same time in an online church space that is functionally treated as a second best experience for second class citizens of the church with the better Christians doing the more important work in the physical space associated with the church and its worship. Those with long COVID and acquired disability find themselves to be joined to the other marginals, though perhaps with less lifelong experience of their own to draw on to help them deal with their status. They are twice disabled, once by their experience and condition of long COVID and once by the church. So let me turn then in the third place to think about some biblical resources for disenabling norms and a-centering churches to address these experiences of uh, autism, long COVID and other marginalized identities. Um, I wanna stress again that what I'm, gonna what I'm going to consider here as we think about the, the need to a-center, to conceive the church in a-centered terms is not intended to detract from the values of theologies that identify themselves with the edge or the margin. If anything, it's a necessary pairing to these, a counterpart. Theologies from the edge rightly identify themselves as marginal to institutional structure and social value and assert the significance of that location within the presence and workings of God. My point here is that an A-centered church uh, should hear this as a prophetic challenge to the human instinct that valorizes places or structures and the particular kinds of people that we associate with these over others. Now, the key concept that underpins what I'm going to talk about in this section is divine presence, where God is and how the presence of God's self is transformatively active and open. The presence of God divinizes or deifies our creaturely reality. Part of the problem with our 
disabling norms and centered churches is that they unwittingly conceive that presence as confined in some way or as graded, as more here than there, or here in greater amounts or greater densities than there. And further, they often see our creaturely reality not as something good itself in which the life of God is beatifically present, but as something that God redeems us from. Now, even here, the tendency to project human values and human identities onto God leads to asymmetries. There is presumptively more for God to do in transforming the creaturely reality of the disabled person than there is in the equivalent transforming of the able-bodied white male, because the image of God is subconsciously often identified with something that looks like the latter. Approaching the issues as a matter of presence, uh, an image that may seem bland, but is actually central to the biblical concept of covenant, allows us to deal in a theologically nuanced way with the question of the relationship between the divine and the disabled. Nancy Iceland's famous work, The Disabled God, contributed to a significant shift in theological discourse about disability, sitting alongside other works that have challenged the problem of identifying God, sometimes through the significance of the human image of God, in terms shaped by androcentric and often white presumptions about power and perfection. Now, this is captured by the title of Cheney MacDonald's book, God is Not a White Man. Iceland's work has been found vulnerable, though, to the criticism that it involves a category confusion, applying the creaturely possibility of disability to the uncreated, uncreaturely God. Lisa Powell has recently revisited Iceland's work and effectively repaired this potential vulnerability, and her theological approach to doing so is, I think, entirely on point for what we're doing here. Powell's core point, developed out of the work of Karl Barth, is that the uncreated God is eternally united through the incarnation of Jesus Christ to the created world. The particular flesh that God has elected to unite to their own life is one that is finite and ultimately disabled, socially disabled, we might add, by the violence of those in power, the violence of those who crucify. Because God in God's self is eternal, not contingent on the flow of time that is proper to the realm of the creature, that union itself can't be considered in terms of before, during and after. It is eternally true of God. So, while the human flesh of Jesus came into being, lived and was killed at a particular point in cosmic time, the reality of the union between God and this disabled human is an eternal thing in the life and being of God. In this precise sense, God is eternally disabled. And the key is that the disability is eternally unified to their own life. This is a matter of God's electing, God's choice to be present with and in the created order, according to the formula of the covenant, I am with you, which generates an ontology of covenantal union. God was never unchristlike. God was never uncrucified. God is eternally a disabled God. Now, if that all sounds a bit abstract, let me go in the first place to a few texts in, this, in the New Testament that will help to illustrate how the identification of God is affected by this identification of God's being in Christ. In Colossians 1.15 and following, for example, sometimes described as the cosmic Christ passage, the beloved son is described as the image, that is the visible rendering, of the invisible God. The beloved son is the one by whom all things were made and in whom they hold together. But interestingly, the text doesn't represent this beloved son as some disembodied pre-incarnate person which is the way that we sometimes think about it. Despite the fact that the Son was before all things, the passage repeatedly identifies him with respect to his coordinated identity as a creature, 
as the firstborn of all creation. And that identification itself is coordinated with or equated with his mortal suffering. The firstborn of all creation is the firstborn of the dead, who has made peace through his blood of the cross. The identification of God then as the creator and the sustainer of the cosmos is now particularized in terms of the Son. But the identity of the Son is not abstracted from the identity of Jesus of Nazareth, the one by whom all things were made and in whom all things hold together is the one whose flesh and blood accomplish redemption. The creation of the cosmos is a work of God in the crucified Christ. That's a distinctively um, Christian representation of God as creator. And the key to this is presence. God was pleased to have their fullness dwell in the flesh of Jesus, electing to be in that self, that place, that death, that disablement. And to reiterate, because God is eternal, there is no before which or after which to this union. Now, that same emphasis on the redemptive and purposeful presence of God uh, and of God's fullness emerges in John 1. Uh, the word became flesh and dwelled among us. Interestingly, there are temple overtones to that language, which will become important to what I say in a moment and draw us near to, nearer to the key observations. In Colossians 1.15 and following, the fullness of God dwells in the beloved son, an image redolent of the glory of God in the temple in biblical and Jewish tradition. In John 1, the word became flesh and camped or tabernacled among us. In John 2, Jesus will identify his own body as the house of God. Elsewhere in the New Testament, the imagery of the temple as the place of divine presence and access is then mapped onto the community of Christ, uh, the community of his followers, the church, both in terms of their individual bodies, as in 1 Corinthians 6.19. So you can't do what, whatever you want to do with your own body because that body is now a place in which uh, God resides as a temple, but also in terms of the collective identity of the church, as in 2 Corinthians 6.16 and as in 1 Peter 2, where we read, coming to him, the living stone, you are being built as living stones into a spiritual house. There's a crass and simplistic way to read such imagery in relation to the Jerusalem temple, understanding it as a kind of replacement theology or supersession. That's a mistake, and I think one that's grounded in the tendency to presume that the significance of the temple is primarily determined by its role in developing narrative, rather than by its capacity to represent in spatial ways divine presence and access. Uh, and here, what I'm saying is channeling the work of, of one of our doctoral students, Rachel Danley, who's working precisely on this in relation to John. A replacement narrative tends to overlook or to relativize, relativize the extent to which we can find equivalent parallel phenomena of temple language and imagery used in biblical and Jewish traditions of spaces or events outside of Jerusalem that are sacralized and sanctified such that the encounter with divine holiness, divine presence, is paradigmatically associated, sorry, that is paradigmatically associated with the temple, is now mapped onto other, often everyday spaces, without the significance of the temple, thereby being superseded or nullified. There are the various places of encounter, of divine encounter in scripture, where humans raise stones of remembrance to their meetings with God. The temple is evoked in domestic architecture and it seems in synagogue architecture and adornment from quite early times. The Pharisees, who have often been misrepresented in flatly villainous terms by Christian tradition, actually seem to have been quite widely preoccupied with a kind of democratizing of temple realities for the wider populace, making it easier for people throughout the land to treat their, their daily domestic spaces as local instantiations of the temple, little places where divine presence could be experienced and divine holiness respected. What we find then within the New Testament is not uh, a distinctive replacement of the collective monolithic culture of the temple in Judaism, but a particularization of a tendency within Judaism to see how the temple functions emblematically within a wider culture 
that considers itself to enjoy access to God's presence. Now, that um, the distinctiveness about the New Testament approach is the way that it centers on Jesus, and not just on the person of Jesus of narrative, on Jesus of Nazareth, but the fact that this Jesus of Nazareth is particularly associated with the violent death of crucifixion. It's shaped throughout the New Testament by a sense that the incompatibility of the crucifixion with normalized human standards of strength and vitally the relationship to institutional centers needs to be taken seriously. We preach Christ crucified and are summoned to go to him outside the city in the language of Hebrews. It's commonly recognized in theological reflection on the cross that it's, its essential senselessness, its fundamental failure, must not be obscured by our attempts to have the event itself make a kind of human sense. Particular theories of atonement can effectively treat the cross as a kind of voluntary heroism, where the saviour placates the rage of an angry God, in a way that placates, in, sorry, in a way that robs Pilate and his soldiers of their culpability. The cross thereby becomes just the necessary evil before the triumph of resurrection and ascension. But the New Testament writers seem insistent that the weakness and trauma of the cross itself has a representative function for the shape of Christian life. God's strength is perfected in weakness, such that weakness itself becomes boastworthy as we continue to be weak in him. This inversion isn't something that minimizes the suffering of trauma, but rather that nullifies the instinct to elevate human power and idealized embodiments of it. God has chosen the weak things, the things that are not, to nullify the things that are strong, the things that are. Now the coordination of this with institutional spatial imagery is important. Christ was crucified outside the city. Uh, and that's the ideal place to join his broken body in the presence of God. In fact, many in the early church did this. Um, while we're often familiar with the stories of Christians meeting in the catacombs under cities, fewer are aware of the extent to which early Christian worship often took place in cemeteries outside city walls. The living stones of God's spiritual house are joined to the living stone that was rejected by men, but chosen by God. Imagery of this kind is intended to define the kind of institution that the church sees itself to be and to shape how it considers its institutional institutions to be understood. It's essentially united to the one who is rejected and marginalized, and its priestly significance centers only upon his identity. But that identity, for all its non-substitutable particularity, which is just to say there is one and there is only one Jesus, is united to the universal presence of God. Go unto the ends of the earth and I will be with you. The presence of God with the church, mediated through the crucified Christ, whose body is now identified with those united to him, is effectively represented not as a centered radiation, but as a web, as an organic rhizome, to use the Deleuzian language. And it's precisely as such a rhizome that it is in turn entangled with the life of the world to which it should mediate blessing. And I use that web language partly because I find this category, this idea of the rhizome to be fascinating, but also because it resonates with the idea of the web in which uh, much of our online community is linked. This is at once decentering and acentering. It summons Christians to see themselves as those who worship outside the city and refuses to set up any center other than God and Christ, which is, Christianly speaking, the heart of the cosmos itself. It lays the ground for something important that runs through the New Testament manifesting in different ways at different points. Because there's a real concern in the New Testament, perhaps most strikingly visible in Paul's writing to the Corinthians, around an imagining of institutional space that excludes or stratifies in ways shaped by the norms of human strength and religion. In 1 Corinthians 11, for example, Paul's deeply concerned about a performance of the Eucharist that seems to center on a particular 
place within the building and on a particular social grouping within that place with those further removed from it in terms of their social and economical capital, probably seated further from the places of preeminence and going hungry. This is important because Paul's point is that the church in Corinth, including in its spatial arrangements, including in the way that it gathers, seems to iterate the social values of Corinth itself as a city, prizing those who embody the normal ideals of the city, uh, the wealthy, the well-dressed, the able, the smart. The Eucharist, as a remembering of the cross, should challenge this, but Paul sees it as being assimilated simply to, Christ to Corinthian values. Uh, now, this is not to say that Paul himself has it all worked out, or can, without any further reflection, provide us with our corrective standards. But he clearly ev evinces a concern that the structures of the church don't resemble the structure of the gospel itself. Something has been centered that needs to be acentered and decentered. Now, how does all this relate to autism and distinctly to long COVID? And with this, I, I really move towards a conclusion. It should be obvious that the marginalizing experiences faced for years by those with autism and more recently by those with long COVID show how centered on its physical institutions and their leadership the church is and how these are presumptively normalized by the things that our societies, perhaps especially our urban societies, cherish. Often these are projected back onto the New Testament for warrant, much as in Corinth, the social values of the city were projected onto worship gatherings and Eucharist. A basic iteration of this projection is the conflation of meeting together or fellowship, koinonia language, with the form of regularized, institutionally ordered worship in a physical place. Now, as a comment, this isn't intended to minimize the place of institutions or the ordering of what takes place within them, but there's a basic danger of naturalizing a reality that is mutually inhabiting the life of God that is not reducible to those institutions themselves. And that, and that distinction is all too easily elided by our language. Pastors and church leaders will often express a concern at the lack of bodies in their institutional space and vexation that some of the people involved are joining them from home online. And they'll often express that concern by quoting scriptures that speak about meeting together. But they do so in a way that fails to grapple with the fact that many, in the, uh, many of the addressees of the New Testament, maybe even most of the addressees of the New Testament writings, had absolutely no ownership of their time. Their position within the economy was such that they couldn't be expected regularly to attend uh, worship gatherings. They would snatch fellowship when they could. And here, Paul's concerns about the parts of the body with lesser honour, the things that are not, takes on an especially sharp significance. Most of these people would be non-visible in most of the meetings of the church, non-visible because they couldn't be there. And only by a deliberative, intentional affirmation of their union with those celebrating the Lord's Supper could their visibility be constituted. Here perfectly is the difference between inclusion and belonging. To belong, you have to be missed. To belong, you have to be named and enjoyed, even in bodily absence. And your absence has to be acknowledged as an absence only from the physical space and not an absence from the presence or from the workings of God. And so too, your uh, difference from the idealized present within this physical space has to be recognized not to be an absence from the transformative presence of God. To acenter the church involves a recognition that the reducing of shared divine presence to an institutional location is a form of idolatry, as is the presumptive grading of divine presence according to the, the degrees of proximity to that space and the judging of reality in terms of a particular kind of body or person. As with all idolatries, it recognizes that what's wrongly treated as if it were God's self is not a bad thing. 
It may in fact be a very good thing. The institutions of the church may be a very good thing, but they mustn't be seen, they mustn't be identified with God's self and mustn't be seen as themselves the center of divine presence. Recognizing this is vital, is vital to using our institutions well. Now, my time is almost gone, but let me return for a few minutes to the need for a cultural and indeed a theological model of autism and disability. The social model is hugely valuable, but it typically operates with modern Western and Northern understandings of society in which society is principally generated by the interaction of individuals and the environments in which they collectively and the environments that they collectively create. A cultural model builds on this and extends this complements this by acknowledging that communities are saturated and saturating things with phenomena of culture emergent from the interaction of individuals and actually then shaping those interactions. So if our society creates a culture in which the poor or the disabled are considered marginal or less, then more people will actively marginalize the poor and the disabled. This malignant saturation is not merely, in theological terms, repaired by a better society, by being a better community. It's transformed by the presence of God with and in and by the members of Christ's global body. For that body and each of its members to flourish requires the body to understand how culturally saturated it is, how influenced it is by the society around it and how deeply in need of God's own life it is, a recognition that involves an awareness of the ubiquitous human instinct to conceive divine presence and possibility in ways that are centered and graded according to the tyranny of normalcy. If we do that, then perhaps autistic people will be affirmed when they prefer to join the church online or need to leave quickly afterwards or to behave differently in the spaces during the service. Then perhaps those with long COVID can feel that the church space, understood more widely, is one that doesn't affirm their location in a social and legal no man's land, but that is kind to them and truly considers them to belong. Then perhaps those with long COVID would find that autistic believers empathize distinctively with their challenges and play a role in leading the church, a leadership role, in leading the church to support and help them in flourishing in fellowship with God. So I end with this comment, that the reality I've described, this hopeful reality, is not by and large the reality that we see in the church, in the ecclesial world of the resumptive normal. Uh, the old normal has returned, and that's not necessarily a very good thing for many of us. I'm finished. Grant, thank you. Thank you so much. So, as I have um, mentioned, um, please uh, put a message in the chat. I've noticed that um, it might be best if you just send it as a direct message to me rather than openly, openly to the chat. Um, one message has gone to Aidan, one has come directly to me, Aidan's forwarded the one that's gone to Aidan. So, if you want to put things in the chat, rather than doing a general thing, um, if you at least can find me somewhere amongst the list of names on the screen, um, then uh, more I can see them. Um, there, there's a couple of questions already appeared to Grant, but um, while more things appear, I'd like to ask you a New Testament scholar yourself. Um, Jesus's healings, um, are they, how do they relate to abling norms? Yeah, I mean, there's a kind of fascinating conversation about this. Um, and, um, One of the interesting points is that when Jesus heals people in the Gospels, and it needs needs to be kept in mind that uh, you know Jesus doesn't go around like a kind of magic worker, um, or uh, you know he, he doesn't go around like a superhero, um, firing healings out of his fingers left, right, and center, um, and nor do we see something that fundamentally characterizes Jesus' ministry as a ministry of 
healing of that kind. But what's often acknowledged in the engagement with Jesus healings is that there's a more complicated engagement with um, with the society and with the community. So there, there's a holistic quality to, to those healings that's not necessarily visible to modern readers. So modern readers will tend to approach this and say, being blind is a bad thing. And when Jesus heals the blind person, that overcomes the bad thing. It's inter it be becomes interesting to chat to blind people about how they perceive these miracles. because And that's actually the really interesting thing is that once you talk to blind people about how they perceive the miracles, what they see, what they as associate the significance with, is not actually the physical transformation. And in some cases, actually, they find the physical transformation to, to itself be something not desirable. Um, what they find interesting is the impact that that has on the social contextualization of the person, the, the way that it re replaces the person within their community and actually in a very thick way invite some reflection on the various things that then need to happen um, around uh, you know going off go and make an offering at the temple and so on that that kind of thing so that's where I think some of the really interesting work that's been done on disability and healing in the gospels has been done in collaboration with disabled people themselves I'm thinking here particularly of Louise Lawrence's work on sense and stigma where what Louise did was uh, to take as one of the launching points some of um, uh, John Hull's work, but then to actually work and to speak with people who were themselves um, affected by sensory disabilities of one kind or another, and, and really to seek to grapple to understand how they read the text. So that I think is, is one of the key things. Um, there's another point that I think is, is relevant and is worth making which is that those healings themselves um, don't necessarily happen in a scripture vacuum. So the significance of some of these healings becomes attached and associated to ideas of eschatological fulfillment. And I think it's worth noting that um, because uh, there, there is a sense in which they're, they're, they're there to say something. But I think the key thing is they, they get read very differently when they're read by disabled people themselves. And actually on that point, I mean, I, I have a particular set of sensory disabilities, which are not the same as other people's sensory disabilities. Um, and I actually feel personally, because I don't share their sensory disabilities, that I'm a little bit uncomfortable about, in a sense, saying more than I've just said, um, which is not to... It's not to dodge the question, I hope, but just to say that I, I think um, it's important actually to get alongside people who identify with the thing that's healed and to see what they understand to be the actual healing dimension. Is it actually the, the healing of the physical condition or is it something else that they identify the healing with? Thank you. I mean, your point there about it being set into a wider narrative strikes me particularly in version of John's Gospel, how often the miracles are signs by which Jesus and glory is revealed. It's something else is going on bigger than, but also there is that, as you say, the integration. Um, so there's a few questions uh, appeared. Um, there's a couple here that are fairly similar. So you're giving this um, lecture um, um, to, through the Scottish Episcopal Institute. Um, and so it won't surprise you that two of the first questions are around the Eucharist, um, because we are quite a Eucharistic church. Um, how do we, as it would be a communion of a centered people without communion that gathers everyone. Um, how do we gather around the presence of Christ in the Eucharist? Um, should we be thinking more creatively about that? Um, the, the, I mean, the, the, we thought a lot about this as a church during lockdown and, and the issues were a big deal for, for Anglicans. Um, in effect, you're saying let's embrace this acentering. What does that do for communion, for Eucharist, for Eucharistic yeah. presence? What are your thoughts on that? So it's a great question. I, I kind of feel like, <laughs> I sort of feel like the person who wants to say, I'm, I'm, I'm going to identify the problem and the idea and not necessarily the, the practical solution. Because I'm, I'm very aware um, of some of the discussions that took place during the pandemic to, to consider what we do with the, the, the significance. And in terms of the significance, uh, you know, I think it's very important that Eucharist is an embodied um, 
sacrament, the, the embodied quality of it, I think is, is very important. Um, and that I think is, has been undervalued by some elements, particularly within the Protestant tradition, affected by the, the kind of sort of, um, uh, affected by a post-enlightenment tendency to focus everything on the mind and on nominalistic accounts of representation. So I think it is important that it's embodied. And I think everything within the New Testament account would affirm that it's important that it's embodied. It's also, I think, important to affirm and to reflect in our embodied performance of Eucharist the symbolism that the New Testament itself calls attention to, which is the oneness of the loaf, the oneness of the cup. In practical terms, of course, it was always impossible just to have one loaf and one cup um, and, unless you were a very small gathering. So I think there, there must always within the collective imagination of the church have been an acknowledgement that the oneness dimension needs to be uh, articulated and imagined in a sense. And th to, to say that something is imagined doesn't make it any less real. It might make it less, um, it might mean that it's not physically particular, particularized in a certain way, but it doesn't make anything any less real. To say that it's imagined means means that we engage our imaginations to associate meaning with a particular set of symbols, which is also why it's possible to talk about breaking the one loaf and have a gluten-free loaf um, available for people with celiac. Um, as it happens, I also have a spectacular wheat allergy, so uh, I, I resonate with that one too. Um, so what that means, I think, is, is that there's, I think there's actually a lot of space for us to think about how we can reimagine the performativity of something that does need to be a physical uh, sacrament and does need to involve an assertion of our togetherness, um, but potentially the possibility of doing that in different places. I mean, the reality, again, is that Many in the early church simply would not have been able to join with others to share Eucharist um, in, in the spaces in which they were enjoying Eucharist. How did they access it? How did they take it? There might be all kinds of ways that they did that. Um, the key, though, is, is a kind of collective imagination that I think isn't segregated from the institution. Um, so I think there's a way of Im imagining this where People don't feel they're, they're holding kind of re rebel Eucharists um, online, uh, but where the institution finds ways to institutionally participate in, in that. So, as I say, I, I honestly don't have the answer. And I'm, I'm very conscious as well that others, I mean, my colleague in Aberdeen, uh, Paul Nimmo, is working specifically on Eucharist. Um, I'm aware that others have engaged in the topic from a distinctively um, Baptist point of view. But, but certainly my perspective, which I would have to say has, has swung around to be in a much more highly sacramental view than the one that, that in a sense, I grew up with um, through, in, through interacting with the New Testament. Um, but I think we need to think imaginatively and, and to allow that the imaginative conception of Eucharist does carry significance. Thank you. And I guess to some extent, the experience of lockdown um, forced many who never had to think about these questions to have to think about it for the first time that had been <laughs> the, the old normal for people for many prior to, to the experience of COVID. I mean, just, just to say something very quickly on that as well. Um, you know, it, interesting, my experience for many years has been of um, joining in Eucharist with churches that very seldom took my dietary issues into account. So I would need to find some way of... of imagining the significance of what I was doing that didn't involve actually putting the bread into my stomach or chewing the bread. Yeah. Otherwise, I would get very ill very quickly. Um, and that's probably true for, for, for many people. So the, the reason I'm saying that is that I think probably many of us have actually already engaged in, in imaginative accommodations of um, Eucharistic practice. Um, and, you know, I think we just need to think further about this. No, very helpful. Thank you. Um, the next question that's come up is somewhat linked to this. Um, the comment's been made um, that you you rightly point out the democratizing and equalizing effect of um, lockdown experience um, and how it became an opportunity for for 
um, well, yes, a more level playing field. Um, is there a danger, however, now in this return to an old normal that we embrace some form of hybrid accommodation? But in fact, all that does is return to the old normal and say, well, everyone else can just join online and they remain as somehow second class citizens um, rather than the physical gatherings being more welcoming, more inclusive, more accommodating. Um, and how does that relate to your concept of an A-centred church anyway? Yeah, no, I, I see what you say. I think that's a very good point. And I think that's kind of where we're at just now, actually. So, we, we you know, we have hybridity of some kind, uh, not necessarily in all churches, but I think most churches, many churches at least, have hybridity of some kind. There is a kind of second class quality. And yes, there, there is a problem where, um, where factors within the church, what you've you labelled there as welcoming, um, and I think that's a good word, but I think I would want to to go further um, with that and, and to recognise that it, it actually needs to go much, much deeper down. And when we say welcome, we need to allow that that word has a really deep significance. Um, and I think one of the key things actually, so one of the key things I think is just naming this point. So I think once we name this idea of the need for an A-centre church and the need to affirm the distribution of divine presence, the universal quality of that, um, then we can, I think, recognise the, the obligation to practice love for those both who are not physically present and those who are absent. And I think the interesting thing with practising love, and I use the word practising because it, it, it implies that you actually have, have to practise it. You, you have to keep working at this. Um, and it involves, I think, being careful to find out what the harms that are being occasioned often unwittingly are. Um, so, I mean, the thing I often talk about, and it's just because it's my own, one of my own triggers is, um, you know, are you a welcoming church that still has smelly soap in the bathrooms that will freak me out? Um, or, or, you know, interestingly, are you a welcoming church where there's a culture of people wearing perfume to the church, which again will freak me out. The problem is not that you've done that. The, the problem is whether you've found out that that's a problem, whether you've got a culture that actually allows you to find out that that's a problem and whether you've done anything about it and, and what that might signify. I mean, there's nothing wrong with these hand soaps and there's nothing wrong with people wearing perfume. And there, there might be a kind of personal self-sacrifice for some people not to wear perfume or cologne um, uh, or use whatever it is they use in their hairs. Um, the, the point of these things is, is it's about creating cultures that listen to people to find out where injury is, injury is caused. And I think, so one, for me, one of the really important things is institutions are not in and of themselves caring entities. Institutions can't make people belong. You know, institution, institution, whether it's the church or the academy, it can address issues of inclusion, but that doesn't necessarily make it a caring institution. When it comes to it, it's the people who care and the people collectively shape a culture. So I think it's about thinking about, you know, are there ways that we can foster a culture of caring and, and a culture of caring that doesn't see those who are at home or those who are here who don't who don't conform to the idealised expectation as just as important, um, as, as just as significant, and therefore just as needful of the church accommodating their, their needs and their hopes and their expectations. It's all, you know, it's, all, it's actually about creating a culture of flourishing. Um, what, what do we need to think about doing if we're all collectively to flourish together? Which all sounds very vague and very, you know, nice and cosy and aspirational. But I think when it comes down to it, it also comes down to being prepared for someone to tell you, I, I can't cope with the way that this church smells. Right. Um, and actually not simply to be hurt by that, but to make a difference. I'm going to chat to some of my colleagues about incense. I'm actually going to wind a few people up with that one, but I'll leave that for another day. <laughs> um, both of those questions were, um, somewhat predicated still on the concept of place and space and meeting and gathering. And I do want to move to 
um, what we talked about toward the end of your lecture around a vision of an A-centered, D-centered church and the language of rhizomes and, and, and what have you. Um, and, and just name a few things that's a sort of different but similar and hear your reflections on it in the sense that it strikes me there are a number of A-centerings going on both before COVID and reinforced by COVID because COVID seemed to accelerate lots of existing things. So I'd include in that, um, for example, a huge rise in interest in pilgrimage and, and holy spaces being, you know, multiplied. Um, and even in, even in Scotland, you know, all places, pilgrimage is becoming quite a thing. Um, there have been a lot of, you, you've talked a lot about the pressure to return to gathering and, and, and I'm very familiar with those sort of Bible verses that are quoted and thrown at people about the importance of gathering. And yet lots of church leaders have had struggled with the fact that somewhere close to a third of all people have never have not returned to regular gathering, but have actually found that to be quite a liberating, freeing experience in terms of their spiritual walk of life. And that can be quite challenging to church leaders who operate in a certain paradigm. Um, Steve Aislop's research on the invisible church and, and the kind of done with church or de church Christians, um, who again themselves have also found that to be actually quite a freeing experience in terms of their, their spiritual walk. So there are a number of different but sort of related things that are all manifestations of this model of a centered church that you articulated towards the end of the lecture. Um, you don't need to necessarily refer or, or come to any of those patterns, but there are other examples of what you're talking about. And I'm wondering how, what your thoughts are on that and how that might particularly work for people with autism or people with long COVID as a model for church for the future, rather than getting back to normal and being glad that the interruption has ended. You seem to be muted, but I'm sorry. Sorry. Um, <laughs> you'd think by now, after so many years of, of this, that we would know how to unmute ourselves. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think I would add actually to what you've said, um, that one of the areas I've become very interested in, in, in the more historically oriented parts of my research is um, the, the phenomena of what's sometimes referred to as the second church in, in antiquity, which is which is the, the parts of the church that made the institution uncomfortable. Um, they, they weren't necessarily aligned with institutional values. Um, and interestingly, often because they were they were they were in areas where the institution its reach was a bit limited um and also within those areas they participated in uh the the worship and communities of of other religions and faiths so there, there was a kind of mutuality they still fundamentally identified themselves as christians but they were happy going to the synagogue they were happy learning from the synagogue um and I think one of the interesting things um, about that, they also, by the way, you know, that there's a lot of evidence for developing domestic church spaces, basically, where people treated their church, their homes as churches, not house churches necessarily, but, but where there, there wasn't necessarily a need to go to some kind of institutional space. Um, but I also think one of the interesting things here is, I mean, we've talked a little bit about Eucharist, but broadly speaking, Maybe it's a little different in, in um, the Episcopalian Church because, because of the, the liturgical year that you follow. But broadly speaking, there's less domestic performativity of religious faith than there would be, for example, in Jewish communities, where there's much more daily, weekly, uh, annual, calendrical performance of activities that... Um, identify the presence of God or are considered to identify the presence of God such that um, the significance of the temple remains but is is remapped in all kinds of interesting ways on to, onto daily life. So I think there's a sense in which some of that phenomena, some of those phenomena of people drifting from the church and not necessarily coming back to the institutional centre reflect something interesting about people who um, whose imagination for what it looks like to, to be faithful has been overly focused by particular ways of being church onto 
the institutional building. And of course, pastors are always totally preoccupied with how many people are in their building, their space. That's what they identify with the success of the church. It's actually, you know, it's interestingly equivalent to a lot of what Michael Green used to talk about with um, the way that people thought about work in relation to faith, that um, uh, people aren't necessarily encouraged or equipped to think about their vocational workspace as a place where God is present and is working through them. So if if on a Wednesday, if on a Wednesday night, which in my night is in my head is prayer meeting night from, from my tradition, if on a Wednesday night they're not at the church, either because they're working or because they're too tired, there's a sense of disappointment that the prayer meeting numbers are so low. But actually the vocational church is, is doing something else. I mean I think partly what I'm trying to say with a say centering language is if, if we give that a kind of priority, a preeminence in the way that we talk, and then begin to think about these other aspects of embodied faith, um, we can gain, I think, some kind of richer purchase. I mean, you know, obviously what I'm not saying is that people decouple themselves from Christian community, but that the institutions and the institutional leadership recognize that what they are is a kind of organizational facilitation rather than the thing itself. Um, and, and once we do that, then actually there's a whole lot of stuff that becomes really interesting. Yes, and some really interesting implications for how we understand ministry and how we train people for that. Um, it's very substantial implications. Um, so there's one final comment, and I've, I've been trying to think about how I can um, summarize it, um, but, but I think I'll read it out loud and um, give you a moment to comment on that, and then I'll hand back to my colleague, uh, Michael Hull. Um, so the comment comes, This your work helps us to rethink incarnational theology and how we view the body. Perhaps trauma theology is helpful to come to do as well. But look only how we view weakness, failure, and vulnerability seems key, and therefore certain agenda comes into play as well. Do you think exploring these marginal contexts collectively helps or minimizes each individually? I have found expression through the arts helpful. So any reflections or comments on that? So I, I think my primary, I mean, I, I'm, I'm delighted to hear someone talking about trauma theology. One of my colleagues in Aberdeen, Katie Cross, is, is particularly associated with this and has worked with Karen O'Donnell and others on trauma theology. Um, I, I, it, I mean, it's, it is a really fascinating area. The best thing I can say about this myself is that my experience is that there's a, an associative affinity between these areas. So even though they're not identical, because they often share intersectional experience, they can be enormously fruitful and powerful. So autistic people find themselves on the margins. Minority language people find themselves on the margins. Um, people who have a, a particular gender identity um, or sexuality identity will find themselves on the margins. Um, and they find themselves, we find ourselves often coming together and finding that we're speaking the same language, so to speak. Um, we're, we're experiencing the same things. And actually, I think one of the interesting things with, with recognizing that is um, there can be dangers involved in the, the experience of victimhood. Um, so there, there, there are ways in which we, we need to be careful about how we process what it is to be marginalized and how we respond to that and to do it in a way that that's um, that doesn't itself become part of the problem. But my experience is that actually, once we start talking about these things together, we find so much in common that it tends to constructively address many of these concerns. And actually, interestingly, I find people who you would expect to be very closed mind on cert certain issues, finding themselves to be much more open-minded either than you expect them to be, or even than they would expect themselves to be, because one of the associated or intersecting issues is true in their lives. So, you know, I, I can think of people who um, have close experience with autism, not themselves, but through their family, who find themselves um, talking in quite interestingly open ways about, other issues, um, which you might expect them to be, to go down a very particular line on, but they're actually open to talk about them because their experience of autism has opened them 
and, and made them aware of the extent to which they have normalized something that needs to be denormalized. The, the way themselves, they've presumed a certain tyranny of normalcy to, to be the way that things should be. That would take us into a much bigger conversation if we really explored that. Um, but I do think the interesting thing is, is that what we find on social media and what we found through our centre is a kind of intersection, an intersectionality of um, marginalised identities that often prompts us to think about how we might ourselves have been perpetrators of marginalisation and to rethink our status uh, and, our, and our actions in those terms. I don't know if that answers your question or not. Well, I think... I there's sort of a mix of a question and a comment there, and I think what you've done is you've added, uh, you've, you've confirmed and added to what the uh, the question is asking, so thank you. Um, thank you for engaging with those questions. I'm going to, at this point, hand back to my colleague, the principal of SCI, Professor Michael Hull. Mike. Um... Thank, you. thank you, Richard. Thank you very much, Grant. Before I, I give a formal vote of thanks to you, Grant, I, I'd like to take a moment to thank Richard for leading the Q&A, our Director of Mixed Mode Training. I'd like to thank Aidan Strange, the communications representative from the Scottish Episcopal Church who's managed all of this Zoom B meeting. And I'd like to thank Linda Harrison, our administrator, who's behind the scenes here coordinating the waiting room. But most of all, Grant, obviously, I'd like to thank you for, if you will, raising our awareness in terms of our use of language. One thing I know I'll take away from this evening is that phrase, the tyranny of normalcy. And Taking that away, I'll take with me also the ways in which it may or may not be, or may well or may well not be applied in terms of the various communities in which I find myself. You mentioned, for example, the tyranny of normalcy in terms of physicalism and ableism, in terms of, if you will, our embodied bodies, but also in terms of our personalities and in terms of intersectionality and so many other factors that relate to where we stand in relationship to other people and where other people are in relation to ourselves. I, being somewhat extroverted, had a bit of a truckle when you talked about churches gathered around extroverts. And when I think of the sorts of folks that um, I um, shared ministerial studies with, I, I see a, perhaps more than one extrovert there and when you ask questions about whether or not we look for introverts or the disables in terms of our congregants, the immediate thing that rose to my mind was whether we look for them in terms not only of our congregants, but also of those who are in ministry. All sorts of things that you mentioned, questions of spaces, questions of events, and where the center lies or ought to lie, have certainly raised our awareness. Um, the example you used also of academic conferences, which many of us participate in alongside of our church meetings, was very, very poignant. And I've seen uh, many of the things that you've mentioned, obviously, uh, during the pandemic and thereafter. And then again, the tyranny of normalcy in terms of, well, really, what was the old normal and what is the new normal? And if we say we're going back to the old or we're sticking with the new, what exactly are we talking about? Relating that also to long COVID has been very helpful because as you mentioned just at the end of this Q&A, lots of us have been, if not transformed, certainly strongly influenced by the experience of people after the pandemic um, in ways that we would have never foreseen before. And some of us are struggling with the ways in which we'll go forward um, with the aftermath. I'm also taken, and I'm sure we were all taken, by the biblical resources that you used. Certainly I'll go back to Colossians chapter one. Um, I suppose we all go back again and again to John chapter one for one reason or another, um, but also to first Corinthians and think again about this tyranny of normalcy and how we center or a center ourselves going forward. So once again, Grant, thank you very, very much. It was a stimulating talk and I know we're all going away with lots to think about. I thank you for, for your goodness. I thank you um, for the sincerity of your presentation, not only its content, but the way in which it was developed in a, in a very personable um, and thoughtful fashion. I also would like to thank all of you who joined us this evening. I'd ask you to continue to pray for the Scottish Episcopal Institute as we find our own center 
and as we identify with God and all of God's people. So I thank you. I wish you a very good night and God's blessing.